Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Byron Davis, 48, of Webster City, was looking for raccoon tracks early Friday morning near a wooded area by the Boone River. Instead, he found a seven-foot-tall animal that he said is Bigfoot. The creature, which had long, thick red hair down its shoulders and weighed about 450 pounds, was just lying there asleep, Davis said. But he said he must have spooked Bigfoot because he walked away quite fast in five-foot strides. Davis said the creature stands straight like a man, but doesn't like a human or an ape. He shined a flashlight on the departing creature, but was only able to see his backside. He said he was able to get within 18 feet of the animal. After the creature departed into the brush, Davis contacted authorities, who checked the area but found nothing. Meanwhile, Davis has volunteered to take a lie detector test to prove the validity of his claim. There's no joke about this, he said. I suppose a lot of people don't believe and are laughing. I could care less. He said he was too dumbfounded to be scared once he spotted the animal. If he had been walking towards me, you bet I would have been scared, he added. Davis is determined once he gets free time to search for the animal. He suspects the animal could be staying in the ravines near the river, which he said is a pretty wild area. He's planning to buy a good camera to take pictures as positive proof that Bigfoot does exist. Then he hopes to sell the photographs. On to the next one. In January, near Edgewood in Clayton and Delaware counties in Iowa, Team Bushaw and a friend saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot with a top knot on its head and covered with long hair. The creature was only six feet from their car. On to the next one. Larry Wilson, a farmer, went outside when the dog barked and he saw a hunched-over dark thing in the yard. Police found long footprints in the grass. This was in Dallas County in Iowa. On to the next one. In Manchester, Iowa, an Illinois Central Gulf Railroad engineer said he saw the meanest animal I've ever laid my eyes on as he chugged along the tracks in his engine in the area last month. Cyril O'Brien, 62, said, I've been traveling these tracks for 38 years now, and I've never seen anything like that. It was the second time Bigfoot-like animal tracks or animals have been spotted in this area in recent weeks. On January 21st, two farmers reported strange tracks in the snow as they surveyed their farmland for areas to plant trees. Delaware County Sheriff Bert Edgel was called and he took photos of the tracks. He showed the photos to conservation officer Jim Becker, who said he couldn't identify them. The tracks have been lost in new snowfall, but Edgel is having the photos enlarged so Becker can get a better look. The tracks, apparently made by a creature that walks on two legs, measured nine and a half inches long and four and a half inches wide. Agile, a hunter for many years, said he had never seen tracks like that before, and because they were found in an isolated area, he is curious and suspicious. Engineer O'Brien of Waterloo said he saw the animal at a distance of less than 100 feet. He said as the train approached, the animal looked up and moved backward. It was big, much bigger than a dog, and at first, I thought that it might be a calf, O'Brien said. 
It was a heck of a mean-looking thing, with long, yellowish hair, a flat face, and short ears. It had no tail. O'Brien said that he noticed the carcass of what appeared to be a cow where the animal had been standing and believed it was feeding on the carcass. O'Brien said the animal walked on four legs. He said he radioed three other trainmen in the caboose and they also saw it and agreed it was indeed a strange creature. Agil declined to link the tracks and the yellowish creature. The tracks and sighting were about six miles apart, but he said there appears to be a strange animal in Delaware County, and he's concerned that someone might get hurt. Bigfoot is a legendary hairy creature in the northwest United States that walks upright. Some people believe it exists and can provide a link between animals and humans. Sightings of strange hairy creatures have been reported in western Iowa for more than a year. On to the next one. Bigfoot rears his hairy head in Iowa again. Many sightings reported in Delaware County. Delaware County Sheriff Bert Edgel never stays far these days without the tranquilizer gun he keeps in his office. That's because Edgel has become the latest in a growing list of Iowa sheriffs who believe that there just might be something to all the talk about Bigfoot. Edgel isn't the kind of man who courts publicity. Quiet and practical, he prefers to keep a low profile and even shuns the efforts of those who want to photograph him. But developments in Delaware County during the past two months have brought the press to his door. Since January 15th, other Delaware residents, solid, practical men like the sheriff himself, have come to Edgel with tales of a strange-looking creature roaming the countryside. On his desk, the sheriff has a file that has grown thick with the testimony of what they've seen. There's been too many sightings, Edgel said last week. These people have got to be seeing something. From the descriptions provided by witnesses, Edgel's nephew, Tommy Edgel, 15, of Edgewood, a budding young artist, drew a sketch of the creature. The sheriff said two witnesses who said they got a close look at the creature say the drawing, which resembles the legendary Bigfoot, is a true likeness. Rural residents who live near here are curious and puzzled about the sighting. One farmer, who asked that his name not be used, said farm folks are asking themselves, could there really be a creature like that in these parts? Deputy Dick Snyder said that, though puzzled by the sightings, country people are taking the situation in stride, and he knows of no one who is arming for protection. If there is a strange creature in these parts, there's evidence it's been here for some time. Agile turned up a witness who says he saw a frightening sight just north of Manchester. That sighting in September was reported by Jerry Ewing, who at the time was a service manager for Manchester Auto Dealer. Ewing now makes his home in Colorado. Said in a phone interview last week that on the day of the sighting, he had driven his pickup truck into the country. I intended to spend my noon lunch period hunting squirrels. I drove out about five miles north of town and pulled into a clearing. I got out of the pickup and in a field about a hundred yards away, I saw a strange man-like animal walking alone. It was about a foot taller than a normal man, and was covered with hair, and was big, real big, going at about 400 pounds. I'm a hunter, and I've seen lots of wild animals, but I've never seen anything like that before. I couldn't believe my eyes. On to the next one. Sometime during 1924, two ladies saw a seven-foot-tall man-like creature covered in light-colored hair in their ranch garden, busily pulling up turnips. The creature also carried some corn during the sighting near Flagstaff in Coconino County in Arizona. On to the next one. In May of 1948, 
At around 10 p.m., Dorothy Longfoot, her husband, and her dog had pulled off to the side of the road in order to get some much-needed rest. They pulled into the desert about five feet from the road. As her husband was preparing the tent, her dog suddenly pressed against her leg and gave a growl, and she looked to see what made him growl. Standing about 50 feet away was a huge humanoid figure. She did not feel threatened by it, but did feel it was looking at her. She began walking towards it with her dog that was still growling. It seemed gorilla-like, but despite the moonlight, she could not see any features. She heard her husband yell out to stop, and she turned her head and felt the dog relax. When she turned back, the creature had vanished. There was nothing within miles for such a huge creature to hide behind. They soon packed up and left the area. This was near Phoenix in Arizona. On to the next one. Near Globe in Gila County in Arizona, at 12.15 a.m., 15 miles east of town, the female witness, her husband, and their two children were driving in their Cadillac when their headlights hit a three-foot-tall figure on the right edge of the road, 100 yards ahead. The creature had long arms, was dark in color, had a pumpkin-like head, yellow glowing eyes, and no nose, mouth, or ears. It was hairy as well. The small, hairy humanoid was facing left and appeared about to cross the road. The witness slowed the car, and the humanoid looked at it and then ran back into the brush, out of range of the light. On to the next one. Near Flagstaff in Coconino County in Arizona, two students were parked in a car when a five-foot-tall hairy humanoid looked inside a window at them at 1 a.m. Were they doing homework as well? On to the next one. In the summer, we were not too far out of Kingman in Mojave County, and we had passed a filling station not that far back. I think we were on Route 66. My youngest daughter was about eight when it happened. We had just passed Kingman, Arizona, traveling back to Oklahoma. My sister was with me, and our children were asleep in the back. We were driving one of those Volkswagen love bug type vans. So when I say that what we saw was taller than our vehicle, I'm saying that it was taller than the Volkswagen van. It was dark, probably around 9 p.m. or later. We were not too far out of Kingman when this creature just suddenly appeared at the side of the road from the shoulder area. It had one hand stretched out toward us. Maybe it was keeping our light out of its eyes. It must have been seven feet tall. Its eyes seemed to glow and they were malevolent. It moved so fast. We were surprised to see it and even more surprised that it kept on crossing the road. I hadn't slowed down and before you could blink an eye, it seemed like it was in the middle of the road and I had to swerve to miss it. And in swerving, I braked a little. My sister screamed at me, don't stop, just keep going. It had less hair on its face than anywhere else. The hair on its arms was real long, and it had hair everywhere else on its body. It seemed big and husky, and it seemed like a man, and at the same time, it didn't. It seemed wild. Its hair was the color of dark blonde. We didn't look back after we swerved. We were scared, and we just got out of there. There was a forest on both sides of the road. On to the next one. My father and I, along with one of his close friends named Chuck, were hunting along the San Pedro River off Charleston Road, midway between Sierra Vista and Tombstone. I was only nine years old at the time, but I can still recall the events of that day. As we were walking along the river, not really a river, more a large creek, we came to a sudden stop when we heard this animal or thing scream so loud that it made me freeze. I looked at my father to see that he had turned ash white along with his friend Chuck. My father quickly changed out his shotgun shell for a magnum load. 
We beat a hasty retreat out of there and called it a day. The scream I remember was very loud. Single scream that lasted maybe five to seven seconds. My father and his friends were both very experienced hunters and had never heard of any animal in all the years they had been hunting a sound as they did this, dying or alive, to include mountain lion, bobcat, coyote, bear, rabbit, or all the others. At the time, I did not know that my father's friend Chuck had seen movement in some mesquite trees about 30 yards away from the direction that the sound was coming from. As we departed the area, Chuck saw large footprints in the sand of the San Pedro River. I'm not sure how he did not see them before. My father passed away a few years back, and I've told this story to many of my friends and to my wife and kids with the same reaction. Nice story. Anyway, I retired from the military and moved back to Sierra Vista one evening while at the Veterans of Foreign Wars, VFW, with my friends and wife, I ran into my father's friend Chuck. I couldn't believe it. After shaking hands and all the formalities, we caught up on old time. The Bigfoot story came up, and I had Chuck, who was now in his early 70s, tell the story without my interference to my wife and friends, and he recalled the event of that day pretty much the same way I'd been telling it for years. I felt a bit vindicated that our stories had jibed and that I was not making this up. I really don't know what it was all those years ago, but I remember the very sound scream this thing made. Hearing the scream together with the footprints in the sand, I suppose equates to a Bigfoot event. I'm not sure, but I know what I heard. On to the next one. In Cass County, Missouri, this wasn't experienced by me. It was experienced by my father. He related the story to me either later that night or the next day. I don't remember. He and his best friend, Gordon, often went fishing and morel mushroom hunting in the woods near Gordon's house, which was just south of town. Gordon had 40 acres, but it was sparsely wooded and had no fishing ponds. I can't remember whether they were headed for some fishing hole Gordon had heard of, or if they were mushroom hunting, but I suspected the latter. The woods they were traveling through were very thick, almost impassable. If I remember correctly, my dad had a machete to hack through the brush. I remember he said that he was having an argument with Gordon along the lines of, where the heck are you taking me? After traveling south from the gravel road, they left my dad's pickup on. He said they found a trail, or at least a spot where the brush wasn't as thick. They started across this spot. I remember he said he couldn't tell if it was a trail or just a cleared out spot, and said they heard a sound that stopped them in their tracks. There had been an eccentric individual that had lived near Gordon who had, a year or so before, let his exotic animal collection loose, which included a lion and lioness. It made all the papers, despite the fact that all animals had been accounted for. The fact that this sound my father and Gordon heard was a definite roar of some large creature that got their attention. And this part of Missouri, bears are unheard of. Fourth are pretty much small trees and brush, not the hardwood areas bears like. Same with bobcats and pretty much any other big game. We have deer and coyotes and not too many of those. My dad said this was a cross between a lion and a bear, and it ended in what he described as a high-pitched shriek like a monkey. Gordon is a pretty superstitious guy, so he totally froze. My dad was more down to earth. He started looking around. They were then hit by a very strong smell. My dad said he almost vomited. He said he was glad he hadn't eaten lunch yet. They heard brush moving, but didn't see anything. And then another howl, just like the one before, but definitely closer. 
That was enough for them. They turned about face and hauled out at full speed, following the path my dad had cut as best as they could. My dad had some nicks and cuts to back up this part of the tale of plunging through the bush. Brambles on his clothing and such. They emerged almost a half a mile from where they entered. That is how fast they were running. My father was a construction worker and just not afraid of much, especially with a machete in his hand. He was not a storyteller at all. If something scared him, he was more likely to lie and say he wasn't scared. He was quite the macho type. Also, every time he drove past that section of the woods to Gordon's house, he always sped up. I could tell something back there got him. He passed away a few years ago, or I'd call him and get more details for you. Gordon may have had a beer or two, but my father was sober by that time. That was what struck us. If he was still drinking, we would understand. But this was quite some time after he'd been on the wagon completely. As far as I know, no other humans even wander through here. Like I said, it was nearly impassable underbrush. There were no landmarks to note, just very dense brush and trees, typical of northern Missouri. There is a small highway, I'd say about a mile to the west of the site, maybe more, and a gravel road some distance north. On to the next one. This was in Cass County, Missouri. My brother, neighbor, and I were on a walk like we normally did almost every day that we could. We would walk miles away from our house, we lived in the country, and would go exploring for hours on end. This time, we were in a soybean field that had been combined and left for the next planting season. Farmers, whenever they plant a field, they leave an area between the field and the fence line not plowed so they can turn their equipment around to get the next row. In this area, we saw something had walked in the grass next to the field that had large steps but didn't think anything of it till we came across a small washout that had brought dirt out of the field into the area of grass into the path of the creature that had walked in the grass there we saw the largest footprint I had ever seen in my life. We looked around for more tracks. We could make out besides the one, but we lost the rest in the woods because it was starting to get dark. The print was long, but not extremely wide. Like the stupid kids we were, we did not get a cast of the print and did not go back that way for a long time. But... After that incident, we were creeped out about going out into the woods without a weapon with us still to this day. It was about 5.15 p.m., just starting to get dark. The sun was starting to go down. It was very remote field that was only visited around harvest time and possibly during deer season. The field was up higher than the grass area and the field tapered down toward the area where the print was found. The other side of the grass area was fenced, and beyond that, very thick wood, with eight miles of creek tributary running through it, a very hilly area in the woods. The area behind the field was wooded, with the numerous Indian mounds in the wood. In front of the field was gravel road where access was. The print area was not seen from the road. The opposite side of the field where the print was was a fenced tree line with open cattle pasture beyond a fenced tree line with eight mile creek running through it not in the same area stories around truman lake area in henry county near clinton missouri when i was in high school an unknown creature smashed a truck hood and carb after being hit on a back road late at night and just walked away from it like it was not hurt On to the next one. Near Oxley in Ripley County in Missouri. My mother and I were on our way home from church. As we drove down T Highway, we observed a large creature standing in the center of the road. 
I stopped the car several feet away, and it turned and looked at us, and then, in one big jump, went from the middle of the road, over a fence, and loped across the field. I hit the gas and got us home, and we ran into the house, locking the door behind us and making sure the windows were locked as well. We were both frightened for months, but never saw it again. This thing was very tall and stood quite upright. It had matted brown fur and a face similar to a man's, not a bear's. It occurred around 9.30 at night. It was very clear out, and if I remember correctly, it was not a full moon, but close. The area is mostly field and wood. In this particular area, it was a field. On to the next one. Near Marceline in Sheridan County in Missouri. It was a bright, sunny summer day. My 14-year-old daughter and I were on our way to pick up my 16-year-old daughter. I was watching the road ahead and saw a figure cross the road from one tree line on the west side of the double Z to the east side tree line. We were about 800 feet away. I asked my daughter to look and tell me what she saw. She said Bigfoot or something like it. It looked about seven feet tall and 300 pounds. It had a long lope as it cleared the road in seconds, and by the time we were where it had been, there was no sign of it, not that I stayed long. It looked like it had long hair. The next weekend, my neighbor came over and mentioned that her six-year-old granddaughter had come in the other day yelling, Grandma, there's a monster in the field. She just brushed it off, and I never told her what we saw. It was 4 p.m. and sunny in farm field. On to the next one. Near Gainesville in Ozark County in Missouri. I was just a kid when I saw it. I was sitting in the back of an old Chevy at the time. It was pretty new. My uncle was driving and my aunt was in the passenger seat and my little cousin, who was around four or five at the time, was sitting in the back with me. We were coming home and I believe from visiting family or something. My aunt and uncle lived down this old dirt road around two miles and right before their driveway, which was on the left was an old dry branch or creek that ran across the road, and it did not have a concrete slab to cover over it, so you had to slow down a little to cross. Directly to the right of the creek was an old driveway leading to an old abandoned house, which no one had lived in for years. It was dark, so naturally we had the headlights on, and as my uncle began slowing to pass over the rough gravel, something in the corner of my right eye came into view. My aunt kind of screamed, but not loudly, because we were amazed and terrified. Something that looked to be around eight feet tall. I know, as a 10 to 11 year old kid, it was huge, came across the branch which led out of the driveway, and not running, but walking briskly, came directly in front of the car. We all just stared as if it was some dream. It was swinging its arms a little and acted like we were not even there. It walked across the creek and crossed the water gate. I don't remember if it went under or over, but what I do remember is the branch had washed out the bank of my uncle's yard, and his perimeter fence was quite tall. If you were standing in the branch and this bright red haired thing jumped over from the bed of the branch like nothing and into my uncle's yard. Mind you, we were still watching in the car. We could see it walk up through the yard and up the hill until we lost sight of it with the headlight. My uncle turned into the drive and we had all locked the doors. My aunt and uncle went through the count of three and we opened the doors and ran inside. We got inside and my uncle got his hunting rifle out and went outside with his floodlight and looked for it on his way back, which he didn't walk far. He tripped on the cord and it came unplugged. Then he yelled and got up and ran into the house and locked the door. 
To this day, if you ask him about what he saw, he will say he saw something, but he doesn't know what it was, or that somebody was playing a joke on us. My aunt will tell that she saw Bigfoot, and so will I. My little cousin was too small to remember much, but I remember, and to this day, I don't go out into the woods without a weapon. To the best of my ability, this is what it looked like. It was around seven to eight feet tall, completely covered in red hair, and one feature I remember is that it looked like its arms were almost as long as its legs, and that it was not afraid of us. Also, at that time, there was a man, I do not remember, but he lived in the area and was at the local store there in Sunder, Missouri, and was telling everyone he had seen Bigfoot, and no one believed him. So none of us ever made much mention to it, except to family or close friends. But I believe I know what I saw. It seems like my uncle the next day could see footprints in his yard, but I don't remember. Late around midnight or so, and it was fairly cold if my memory is correct. The area was wooded, with some open pasture land for cattle, and it was normal terrain for the Ozarks, just rolling hills and creek bottoms. There was a man a month earlier claiming to have seen Bigfoot, which no one believed. On to the next one. I moved to East Texas to live there with my husband. We had about five acres of land there, and our property was surrounded by woods. So we saw all kinds of wildlife there. We didn't have any animals at the time except for our dogs. My husband used to work long hours and would frequently go out of town. We had lived there with no problems for a few months before our problems started up. In the time we were still living there together, there would be odd tapping noises on the side of the house. Once in a while, there would be a bang. Other times, there would be whistles. It was almost guaranteed that something would happen on those nights my husband was out of town. I would notice the dogs getting very quiet, scared even, which was so out of character for them. They would look at the walls as if they were looking at something through them. Something they could see on the outside of the house. Then there would be tapping noises coming from the walls and the windows, and I would know something was out there. I would shut off anything that could make noise. The television, the radio, the computer, you name it. And get very quiet, not moving at all, so that I could hear it better. It really would be clear that something was sneaking around out there. It would circle the house, making noises on the walls every now and then, and then tapping on them. I had made a habit of keeping all the windows closed, and all the curtains pulled whenever my husband was out late or out of town, so at least nothing could see in. There were several times when it would tap on the door, run off the porch, and go hide behind one of the trees. I would never open the door. I kept all the lights off inside and would go to a window, moving the curtain as little as possible, so I could try to see outside without being seen myself, and I had caught enough careful glimpses of it through the window to know what it was. Very tall, very wide, massive figure covered in hair, but the initial shock of that had been replaced by fear when I realized what it was trying to do. I could see eye shine as it peeked around the side of a tree watching the door, and I knew it was trying to get me outside. Whenever this happened, the dogs would be very quiet and scared and would either stay near me or go to try to hide somewhere in the house. They wouldn't bark or make any kind of noise at all. They were such energetic and brave dogs, full of life, though this was not like them in the least. After it waited long enough, it would come back and try again, tapping on the door, then sneaking off to hide behind a tree or circle around the house, tapping and banging on it here and there. After hours of this, the activity would die down and I wouldn't be able to locate it. I would notice my dog going back to their usual selves, which meant to me that it probably decided to leave me alone and go away for the night. It wouldn't do any of this 
unless my husband was gone. It knew when my husband was gone and when to begin its routine, and I felt like it was after me for these reasons. My husband believed me. He had already found signs of its presence, including large footprints outside our house and the imprint of a large hand on a window that's too high up to look through from outside. He had to get something to stand on just to reach it. When he placed his hand over the imprint, we saw that it was much larger than the size of his own hand. Other than that, my husband did hear some suspicious sounding whistles during the day, but he could never find where they were coming from or what made them. I was getting so anxious that I wouldn't go out in the day at all and would stay silent and be up all night just in case. It took a heavy emotional toll on me, and I was getting so worn out by it all that I went to stay at my mother's. My husband said that there was no activity while I was gone, but it was hard living apart. Eventually, we were able to sell that land and move. On to the next one. My name's Luke, and I've been told that when I was a kid, I was pretty rambunctious. But let me tell you, 10 years in the Yellowstone National Park as a winter keeper pretty much beat all of that out of me. Winter keepers are the people who keep the buildings in the park from being crushed by snow. More on that in a minute. When I worked there, I would work my tail off all winter, then it would take a whole summer of fishing at my parents' place to get enough energy to go do it again the following winter. What a life. Winters in Yellowstone and summers fishing the Madison River near Ennis, Montana. It doesn't get much better than that. I was 28 when I quit the winter keeper job as it got too hard for me, mostly mentally, as the isolation was brutal. And, well, I hate to admit it, but there were things there that I just didn't want to think about anymore. I got my job with Montana Rail Link here in Livingston, working on the railroad. The railroad's a steady, good-paying job. But man, I sure did miss being in Yellowstone at first. I would look south towards the park from the rail yard and wish I was down there. But I guess not bad enough to go back and I'll get a good retirement from MRL, which I never would have with seasonal work. So I guess I'm glad I quit winter keeping. I was barely 18 when I started in the park, and I got the job only because my dad had worked there for the road department and knew everybody. I'm pretty sure he thought it would help me keep out of trouble, and believe me, it did, because there's no trouble you can get into out there in the winter. Well, you can get into trouble, but it's the kind of trouble that's likely to kill you. So you have to try and keep your act together. You just don't mess around. For example, I accidentally locked myself out of my cabin and nearly froze to death. My first winter there, it was minus 22 degrees, and when I finally managed to get back in, I had minor frostbite on several fingers, in spite of wearing heavy gloves. I rarely locked that door again the whole 10 years I was there, I can tell you. You can also get into trouble falling when you're shoveling snow off a roof, that kind of thing. The winter keepers develop a kind of buddy system where you check up on each other, and it's just part of the package of staying alive. But there's a whole level of trouble out there that I wasn't aware of, and there's only one person I know of who was aware of it, and nobody believed him, even though he was a highly respected ranger in the backcountry. He told me about it when I first started the job, and even though I was inclined to believe him, any time I'd ask others about it, they would just laugh. But Ranger Jackson had seen the biggest trouble you can imagine out there in the thoroughfare. 
the wildest part of the park, and he wasn't one to play jokes on anyone. He's been retired now for some time, and I never got the chance to tell him about what I saw, and that I now truly believe him. Because I've seen that same trouble myself. But I can tell you this. I definitely believe Ranger Jackson without a doubt. I don't know if he retired because of what he saw, but I don't think he did. He was a tough guy, legendary actually, for running poachers out of the park, and he wouldn't have let anything run him off. I myself didn't leave that year I saw it, though I should have, but I did leave two years later when I saw it again. I hardly even had time to pack my stuff that time. I was in such a hurry. And actually, I think that was one of the few times I did lock the door of that cabin. But before we get into all that, you may ask, what's a winter keeper? Winter keepers in Yellowstone are people who clear the roofs of buildings there. Since annual snowfall can measure from 10 to 20 feet and the temperatures are often way below zero, this can make the snow consolidate into ice and bam, there goes your roof because it's heavy stuff. The snow there is dry and fluffy and just falls apart when you try to make a snowball. But once it hardens, you can cut it into blocks. I've dealt with ice blocks six or seven feet thick, and this kind of weight can quickly collapse the roof. A winter keeper's tool of the trade include a crosscut saw to cut the snow into big blocks and a big flat shovel to push those blocks off the rooftops. Sometimes we lay a rope across the length of a roof and then a person at each end on the ground would pull the rope downwards. This would break the contact between the snow and the roof, and the snow would come zipping off. But it had to be compacted to do this. That was my favorite method, because it all came off at once, with a very satisfying wump. Either way, you have to climb up on the roof, and that can be a dangerous thing. You have to be in good shape to be a winter keeper, but you also have to be pretty tough psychologically to live in Yellowstone through the winter. It's not just the amount of snow and bad weather, but it's also the fact that you're isolated and cut off from civilization. It can get mental real fast, and you'd better be darn self-sufficient. But even with that, it's a beautiful place to live. Most of Yellowstone shuts down for the winter and all the roads are closed. You can still come into the old faithful snow lodge by snow coach and the Mammoth Hot Springs area by car, but all the other visitor facilities are closed down from mid-October to late April. The only way you can get to the other parts of the park is by snowmobile. And if nobody can get you in, you often can't get out. So you have to be able to weather big storms and have a lot of supplies. Once in a while, you can go out on snowmobiles to get fresh produce or milk, but it's a long, cold journey. A good 40 miles, to be exact, from my cabin at Lake Village to the nearest town of West Yellowstone. So basically... The winter keeper's job is to make sure the buildings at Yellowstone don't get destroyed by old man winter. Sometimes we'd also help maintain snowmobile trails and just keep an eye on everything. And I even helped out with a few rescues when snowmobilers got lost. We just did whatever was required, kind of like the early pioneers did to make sure everyone survived. We had better communications than they did, though, with two-way radios and such. When I first started, there were no cell phones, but that eventually changed, and some of the people even had satellite TV. They would hole up for the long nights and eat popcorn and watch movies. But me, I preferred to read and play my guitar. I'm pretty quiet, and that's why I heard things going on that others didn't, for better or for worse. 
My cabin was an old 1940s one-room structure with a fireplace and propane heat. It was pretty sturdy, but I had to get up on the roof and clean it off periodically, just like with the other buildings. I haven't been back to that park for a long time, but last time I was there, that old cabin was still standing. And you know, the scratch marks along the window are still there, though I doubt if anyone but me gives them any mind. If anyone ever notices, they probably think some bear did it. But nope, it wasn't a bear. If you look closely, you can see they're not claw marks, but more like marks from flat nails, not even sharp ones. And going back there, even though it was years later, it still gave me the creeps, seeing it again. I now have no desire to go back again as beautiful as the park is. My cabin was by Lake Yellowstone, and one of the buildings I helped keep clear was Lake Hotel. It's a big building and one of the park's most iconic structures. The area called Lake Village has a bunch of cabins we had to clear, and it took several of us to keep it all up to snuff. I can't remember how many people worked there, as it seemed to vary from year to year, but I do remember a guy named Jimmy who became my best buddy while I was there. Jimmy was, from all places, Hilo, Hawaii, and his favorite greeting was, what the heck am I doing here? He would sometimes substitute the word heck with various cuss words of different severity, some in what I took to be Hawaiian, and it was a good way to tell what kind of mood he was in that particular day. He came the same season I did, and none of us expected him to return the following fall, but there he was. I don't know how many seasons he worked there, but he was still at it when I left. Jimmy soon became known as Heck, and that nickname stuck with him from there afterward. He lived in a cabin a few down from mine, and we were about the same age, so we naturally ended up hanging around some together in the evenings when we weren't too tired. The cabins between us were uninhabited, being summer cabins. Sometimes we worked together, sometimes not, depending on what needed doing. But we always checked up on each other in the evenings. You just bang on the other's door and yell out, yo. If the person yelled back, you'd know all was good and go on home. Well, I'll never forget this night. And I've wondered for years if it didn't have something to do with what happened not too long afterward. It had been snowing for a week and we had plenty of work to do. The weather was really getting to us in the cabin fever department. And yes, we had cabin fever even though we were outside all day because of the gray skies and endless melancholic feeling this particular storm brought with it. Some storms break up right away and you get blue skies, but this one just went on and on each day as dark and depressing as the previous one. Heck and I both discussed it might be a good time to head over to West Yellowstone for supplies, even though we were okay, but we nixed the idea based on the whiteout conditions. It would just be too risky. Besides, we needed to stick around and keep the roofs cleared. Even one day off would get us behind schedule with all the new snow coming down. So we decided instead to have a party. We invited all the other winter keepers, three or four guys, if I recall, and Heck made a big batch of chili and I made popcorn in the big pot on top of my wood stove and took it over to his cabin. We decided on having it at his place as it was a little bigger than mine. Heck always had a big stash of whiskey and he was the kind of guy who liked to share. So our party got a little wild, which wasn't that unusual. Winter keepers basically answer to nobody but themselves, which is why most of them liked the job. So they could party as hard as they wanted, their only retribution being the hangover the following day. To me, popcorn, chili, and whiskey sounded like a bad combination, and I declined the spirit. 
but I will say I enjoyed watching the others get wild and crazy. For a bunch of introverts, they sure let it all hang out. There had been lots of wild parties at Hex, but what made this one stand out was that Hex also had a DVD of the Boggy Creek Monster, and everyone watched it while killing off the whiskey, then decided to go outside and whoop it up, literally. Imagine a bunch of wild men out in the snow, whacking on trees, whooping, screaming, and daring Bigfoot to come visit. And you'll see why I wondered later if this wasn't the catalyst for what was to come, since it was normally so quiet out there. I'm sure the sound carried for a long way. Well, when it was all over, instead of being the designated driver, I was instead the designated make sure everybody's okay person. After I was sure everyone was passed out on Hex floor, I threw some logs in his fireplace, then made my way back to my own cabin through the heavy snowfall, aware that I was getting a bad headache. Now, I never get headaches. I'm just not made that way. If I get sick, it always starts with tight muscles and aches in my shoulders. And I was in my 20s then, and as healthy as a mule. Back at my cabin, I banked the fire, took a couple of aspirin, and crawled into my warm sleeping bag, my rickety but comfy bed feeling pretty good, as I drifted off, glad I wasn't a drinker. I was kind of puzzled as to why I'd gotten a headache, especially so fast. I mean, out of nowhere, and I decided it had to be a contact headache from the whiskey fumes. I was so tired that this sounded logical at the time. The last thing I remember was hearing the wind blow through the trees, making the branches scratch against the outside of the cabin. The only problem was there weren't any trees close to the cabin, but I was sound asleep before that realization caught up with me. I got up kind of late the next morning, and when I looked out, I could see a full-on raging blizzard. I had a strange sense of foreboding. But after a cup of hot coffee and once again banking the fire, I decided I needed to know how my winter keeper buddies were doing over at Hex Place. I bundled up and made my way through a good foot of new snow, careful to stay oriented as it was almost a complete whiteout. Once at Hex, I banged on the door and when no one answered, I pushed it open. The fire was completely out and everyone was still sound asleep on the floor, except for Heck, who had miraculously made it to his bed. I shook my head in disgust, built a new fire, brought in enough wood for the day, started Heck Percolator coffee pot, then went around and tried to rouse everyone. It wasn't easy, but I finally got everyone up and around, and when I was satisfied that they had their senses back, I went on back to my cabin to make myself some breakfast. But as I got there, I noticed something really strange. Something had walked through the snow behind me as I went to Hex, actually overstepping my tracks at times. And whatever it was, it sank very deep into the powdery snow, so deep I couldn't make out anything that would tell me if it had hooves or paws. Something had followed me and it was so heavy, it post hold through the snow. I'll admit, that kind of played with my mind, especially since the tracks were so fresh. I looked all around, but saw nothing, and it was as if whatever it was had two legs instead of four, and was therefore not a moose, bison, or elk. It sank too deep to be a deer, as they're just not heavy enough like that, I opened the door and went on inside my cabin, kind of shaken. As I cooked up some eggs and pancakes, I realized there would be no work today, for the blizzard made it impossible to see anything. If it hadn't been for the dark shapes of the cabins, I would have been quickly lost just coming back from Hex. I decided to stay inside and read a book, or maybe do some of the chores I'd been neglecting like sewing up my old pair of insulated coveralls. 
I hoped none of the guys at Hex would get lost. Maybe they would just stay there and hang out, which would be for the best. Even though we looked out for each other, there was no way I was going to babysit everyone. So I hoped they would just take care of themselves. When you're in your 20s and worried in a situation like we were, you tend to think you're invincible. After all, you can climb like a monkey and cut big blocks of ice and do it all day long. But could these guys make it to their own cabin from Hex Place? I worried about them, even though it wasn't really my deal. But in retrospect, I think I had some kind of intuitive feeling that all was not well. I spent the morning working on whittling a bird call whistle, all my chores handily forgotten. I'd been a whittler since I was a kid, my uncle teaching me how, probably hoping, like my dad, that staying busy would keep me out of trouble. Whittling has a zen-like quality. Your hands are busy and your mind is quiet, and yet it's not completely mindless. As I sat there, it finally occurred to me that I'd heard scratching on the outside of the cabin the night before. And once that thought hit me, I again felt really weird and unsettled, almost like I should flee. I put my whittling down, bundled up, and went outside to look at the side of the cabin. What I found was totally bizarre. Long, deep marks that looked almost like they'd been made with a small chisel, shaken. I headed for Hex Cabin, even though I knew it was totally insane to be outside in a whiteout. I was very mindful of where I was every moment and was very relieved when I got to his door. When I got there, the fire was again out and not a soul was around. Where had everyone gone? I again started a fire and warmed up for a while, then decided I should go home, but felt strangely reluctant to go. I felt more like staying there and barring the door. So, staying is exactly what I did. Though I didn't bar the door, since the door had no bar, surely Heck would be back before long, and maybe I could even spend the night at his place. Everyone had extra sleeping bags for exactly that reason, so I knew he could put me up. I was getting hungry, so I rummaged around Hex cupboard and found some mac and cheese and started some boiling water on the stove. I knew Heck wouldn't mind, especially since he came over to my place and ate me out of house and home at least once a week. About the time I got it all made, I could hear the sound of a snowmobile, and sure enough, it stopped by the door. It was Heck, and he looked like those bison over by the geysers when they get snowballed beards, those clumps of snow and ice that dangle from their chin. Heck barely had the machine turned off before he was inside trailing ice and snow behind him and pulling off his face mask and heavy gloves. He looked surprised to see me. I came over to fix you lunch and warm the place up, I lied. What are you doing out on a day like this? Jeez, bro, he replied. I was worried sick about you. I stopped by your place, and the fire was out, and the door was wide open. Everything okay? I was surprised, as I always made sure my door is closed. Maybe not locked, but securely shut. Did you go over there just to check on me? Why didn't we run into each other? I asked. I took the guys home, he replied. It was the only way I could get rid of him. I stopped by your place to make sure you're okay, and he hesitated, taking off his heavy boots and coveralls, then continued. Luke, I went inside and built a fire, and when I went back out, someone had been messing with my machine. It didn't want to start. Messing with someone's snowmobile in this kind of weather was unheard of, almost an act of premeditated murder. Messing with your sled? I was incredulous. What makes you think someone did something to it? Luke had looked me square in the eye. Somebody went into your cabin and messed it up. That's why the door was open. And when I saw that, I got a real strong feeling of dread, like they were still around. Heck patted his lower back, where I knew he had a concealed gun. We all thought he was crazy to be armed, which was totally illegal in the park. 
but he worried about wolves and bison and such. None of us worried about the wildlife, so he teased him endlessly about being from Hawaii. He continued, When I went outside, I saw tracks, really deep tracks, and I saw that someone had pulled my windshield off. They left snow on the handlebar riser like they were trying to pull it off too. I think I surprised them, and who knows what else they might have done. What did they do to my cabin? I asked, worried. It looked like they just scattered stuff around, ate some food. It's not too bad. Maybe you want to go over there and lock it up and stay there. Go out in this weather, I asked. Heck rolled his eyes. I'm going back out and bringing my sled inside. You should do the same. I'll take you over there. The two of us should be enough to scare whoever it is away. But why would anyone be out in the storm? I asked. Though I didn't expect an answer to what seemed to be an unanswerable question. Then added, your snowmobile won't fit in here. And it has to be a moose. Heck looked doubtful. They didn't break the windshield, Luke. They popped it off. That takes hands. Strong hands. They were intentionally setting me up for failure. You can't see without a windshield in this kind of snow. I laughed nervously. You can't see in this weather even with one, and a moose doesn't have intentions. They just live moment to moment. Maybe it was a bison. Bison have intentions? And hands? You know what I mean. No, Luke, I don't, as per usual. I decided it would be good to tread lightly. As Heck probably had a hangover, I needed to go back to my cabin, though I dreaded it. I told Heck I would walk back and left him complaining about having a headache. The snow was still really coming down, and the lack of definition between the ground and sky made it very difficult to see where I was going. I could still barely make out the other cabins and was soon back at mine. I didn't waste any time getting there, I can tell you. I opened the door and went inside, where it appeared that someone had raided my cupboard, tossing everything onto the floor. Most of my food was canned goods, and whoever it was hadn't bothered those. But my boxes of dried goods had been ripped open and partially consumed, the remainder strewn all over the floor, including bread wrappers. This was puzzling and made me believe the intruder wasn't a person, because nobody can eat six or eight boxes of pancake mix and a half dozen boxes of cereal, as well as a half dozen loaves of bread. This was more than the work of a bear, but no sane bear would be out and about this time of year, as they were all hibernating. The cabin had a musky odor that I couldn't identify. I smelled lots of bears, as they typically came around the cabins in the fall looking for food. In fact, sometimes they would crawl up against the cabin for warmth at night until they finally decided to hibernate. But this musky odor was no bear. It was different. It was gaggy and reminded me of an outhouse and a dead animal combined. Not to gross you out, I'm just telling it like it was. I picked up the empty boxes and threw them in the fireplace, swept up the remains of everything on the floor, and also threw it in the fire, put the plastic wrappers in my trash box, then proceeded to try to tidy everything back up, ignoring the unsettled feeling that was growing by the minute. Soon, it was time to go outside and get more wood. The fire Heck had built was almost out, as he hadn't set the fluke properly, making it burn too hot and fast. I really didn't want to go out in a blizzard, but it was that or eventually freeze. I was well versed in the Yellowstone cold and knew not to go outside without being prepared, even if just going out to get wood from next to the cabin, as you never knew what could go wrong. I dutifully slipped into my insulated coveralls, warm boots, and coat. I grabbed my heavy gloves and opened the door. The wood pile was nearby, and I quickly had a nice pile tossed into the middle of the cabin floor. The wind was howling, and by the time I was done, several inches of snow had blown inside. As I was sweeping it back out, I thought I could hear something over the wind. 
I paused and listened. It sounded like the combination of someone tearing paper and sneezing. I recognized this as the call of the great gray owl, sometimes called the ghost of the forest for its elusiveness. One of the largest owls in the area with a wingspan of five feet. I'd heard this call many times and it always made me wonder how it made such a strange sound. I remember thinking it had to be on the roof of the cabin for me to hear it above the wind, which I found odd, as usually birds hunker down in the shelter of trees in storms and don't sit around on roofs practicing their bird calls. I closed the door and decided to make myself a peanut butter sandwich, but then realized all my bread had been eaten. This was serious, as I didn't want to subsist on canned food alone, though I did have enough I wouldn't starve for a while. Maybe I could get the guys to all pitch in a loaf or two to help me out. But I was cabin bound until the storm ended. We were sure going to have a lot of cleaning up to do. And then maybe after that, if the weather held, I'd go on out to West Yellowstone and get more fresh food. I could use a break anyway. I spent the rest of the day just being bored, wishing the weather would improve and trying to decide if I shouldn't go on back to Hex for another visit and bum some bread off him. But then a thought occurred to me. My cabin had been a source of food for whatever or whoever broke in, and who was to say they wouldn't come back again or even try the other cabin? The thought was kind of nerve-wracking, and I decided to stick my head out and see how the storm was coming along, since my window was now iced over. As I opened the door, the snow that had accumulated against it fell inside, and I had to sweep it back out, the cold air coming in. But it looked like things were improving as the wind had died down, and instead of nothing but white, I could now see a band of dark clouds to the east, telling me that the main part of the storm had passed. I then heard another owl call, and it again sounded like it was on the roof. This one sounded like a sawet, one of the smaller owls, with a wingspan of less than two feet. The sound was a series of short toots, like someone playing a one-note recorder. As a winter keeper, you can't help but get familiar with the wildlife, and I enjoyed the birds and often fed them nuts and grains when it got really cold which was against the park's rules, but I did it anyways. I did this because I felt sorry for them when it was so extreme, but also because I liked having the company. So I'd become somewhat familiar with what was what, even the owls, as I would often hear them in the woods at night. As I stood listening, I realized that the sound was way too loud for a sawet. I mean, in order for the owl to have that kind of volume, it would have to be the size of a goose or even an ostrich. I suddenly had the strangest feeling that the owls on the roof weren't owls at all and that I should get back inside. I closed the door just as half the snow on the roof came down at once, making a loud whoomp. My doorway was now probably blocked from the sound of it. Now what? I was most likely trapped in my own cabin, but at least nothing else could get inside and bother me. Hopefully. Heck and the others would eventually miss me, or come over and dig me out. But so much for going to Heck and bumming some bread for sandwiches. I knew if worse came to worse, I could crawl out the window, assuming it wasn't frozen shut. But it wasn't something I wanted to do. And, of course, since I couldn't have a sandwich, it started sounding better and better until a sandwich became the height of gourmet delicacy and almost worth dying for. I wanted one so bad, I felt like moaning, until I realized something outside actually was moaning. My first thought was that it was Heck or one of the guys messing around, but a repeat performance convinced me it was too loud, and all of a sudden, all my denial was gone. I flashed back on the classic scene in Boggy Creek Monster, where the monster breaks the bathroom window, and I can tell you, I was much more scared than that guy had been. I was utterly terrified, 
for I knew without any doubt that what I was hearing was the same thing. I recalled talking to Ranger Jackson about what he'd seen up on the thoroughfare, and I knew that what had been theoretical to me then was now reality. I knew I was hearing a Bigfoot, complete with other owl imitations, which seemed to be one of their preferred means of communication, and since they were communicating, there had to be more than one. This was the kind of trouble Jackson had talked about, except he'd only seen one. Now, it all made sense. The deep track, something pulling my cabin, something pulling off Heck's snowmobile windshield, the rating of my cabin, the owl sounds, all of it, and it all started with the guys being idiots and whooping and hollering after watching that dumb movie. I could see the Boggy Creek monster clearly in my mind's eye, and I knew it had to be just like the one on my roof. Now, from nowhere, I started getting another headache. Everything started feeling fuzzy and disoriented. I grabbed my water jug and drank a bunch, thinking maybe I was dehydrated, but the headache got worse. I now started to feel panicked. I needed to get over to Hex Place. I couldn't deal with this by myself. I needed his help. But the snow slide off my roof had trapped me, or had it. I realized I hadn't actually tried to open the door and verify it. Since the door opened inward, I was able to slowly pull it open a crack and look out. The snow was about three feet deep, and I was sure I could dig my way out. I listened for a while, but heard nothing. No more owls. The sky was turning a pale pink and I think I could see stars trying to break through the thinnest cloud cover. If I wanted to get going, I needed to make a break for it, now, not later. I kept a shovel inside for the very purpose, and after I'd bundled up, it didn't take long to dig a path through the snow. Even though it was wetter and heavier than normal, I was wary, looking all around and up and down while doing this totally panicked and scared to death, and even though I hadn't seen the Bigfoot, I could picture it in my mind, as if I had only maybe even bigger and uglier than I imagined. It became the ugliest, most menacing thing imaginable, with each shovel of snow. As you've probably guessed by now, I have a good imagination, but I really prefer to be imagining things like gourmet sandwiches, Going back inside, I stoked the fire, then stuck some candy bars in my coat pockets along with a water bottle, flipping my headlamp onto my forehead. I would hopefully not need it, but if I got disoriented, it could be a lifesaver. All the time I was doing all this, the rational part of my mind was saying to stay put, stay home, don't go out. First, if there really are Bigfoot around, you'll be more vulnerable, and second, with the skies clearing, it was going to be bitter cold. Not a good night to be out. I suddenly wished I had a gun like Hex, and this was part of my rationale for going to his place. His place seemed safer, for we could defend ourselves, and there was safety in numbers. I stepped outside and pulled the door tightly shut, again looking around. It was now dusk, but I figured I could make it to Hex Place pretty quickly and beat the dark. Keep in mind that along with my anxiety and fear was what had become a pulsing headache, and it was getting harder and harder to think straight. But I knew the way well, and was soon making a beeline for his cabin. I'm not sure what happened after that. But I vaguely remember something following me, making short whooping sounds with a kind of raspy voice. I doubled back into the tree, trying to ditch it. It didn't seem particularly menacing, more like it was following me for its own entertainment. So I finally came back out and started wandering through the forest, amazed at how beautiful it was with all this new snow, totally forgetting where I was going. The next thing I knew, I was on the back of Hex Snowmobile, 
and he was berating me for being such an idiot and saying that if it hadn't been for my headlamp, he would have never seen me. He took me back to his cabin, and we tried to sort out what had happened. Apparently, he went to my place to check on me and found my tracks. The sun was setting, and the tracks were going the opposite direction of his cabin. He wasn't sure whether to go get the others to help search for me, or to set out himself, hoping that I wasn't far off and he could quickly find me. He decided to follow my tracks, but it was soon so dark he could barely make them out, even with his headlight on. And he was getting worried about getting lost himself. He was about ready to turn around and go get help when he heard a crashing through the woods. He was pretty sure he'd stirred up some bison and was turning around when he saw a light where the sound came from. He drove to the light where he found me wandering around then quickly got me on the back of the sled and headed back, hell-bent. He said he could hear something big following us through the woods, breaking branches as if it were really angry. Finally, back at his cabin, he helped me inside and then locked the front door, putting his loaded gun in a handy spot. I was freezing, so he made me some hot tea and pulled my chair up next to his fire. He told me that I was totally disoriented and thought we were in an airplane concourse getting ready to fly to Hawaii. I also kept telling him we were going to get in a lot of trouble for abandoning our jobs and just letting the snow crash in all the roofs. I don't remember any of this, but I guess I believe him. When he says it happened, the only thing I do remember is wandering through the woods, looking at the starlight shadow trees. I do recall being vaguely irritated when a voice told me to turn on my headlamp. I tried arguing that it would wipe out the shadows, but the voice got angry, telling me to turn it on. If you're not familiar with starlight shadows in Yellowstone, the winter snow is so smooth and the sky so dark that it's possible to see shadows created by starlight. The shadows are faint and it takes your eyes a while to get acclimated to the dark, but they're actually really magical. I asked Heck if he told me to turn on my light, and he looked puzzled. Why would I tell you to turn on your light if I'd already found you? I agreed it made no sense, but I distinctly remember someone telling me to do just that. When, I, when Heck asked me what the voice sounded like, I told him it was muddled. He shook his head and asked, how can a voice be like that? I said, I don't know, and he dropped it. We hunkered down by the fire, and were real quiet, both of us spooked and afraid to talk. My headache was totally gone, and I told Heck about hearing the owls and feeling claustrophobic and feeling like I had to get out of the cabin no matter what. He didn't say much, but then told me he thought I'd been the victim of some kind of mind control. So we talked some more about it, and I asked him why a Bigfoot, if that's what it was, would mess with my mind and then help me get rescued. It didn't make sense. But then, to most people, the idea of Bigfoot existing doesn't make sense. But Heck said maybe it was curious, but it didn't want me to die. So it had me to turn on my light so he would see me. After sitting silent a bit longer, Heck finally got up and picked up the Boggy Creek Monster DVD, opening the cabin door and threw it out into the snow as far as he could. The rest of the night was uneventful, and I went back to my cabin the next day, ate breakfast, and we all went back to work cleaning roofs. I left a month or so after all this happened, when the job ended for the fall. I went back for two more years, always kind of hesitant to return, but when they promised me I could move over to Old Faithful Inn area, I felt like it would be okay. I worked two winters there, and one morning, as I was climbing off a roof, job done, I heard that same saw-wet owl hooting at me. For a minute, I thought it really was an owl, but when a strange feeling came over me, and I started getting a headache, I went to my supervisor immediately and told him I had to leave. I was out of there within three hours, all my stuff packed and on a snow coach. 
I locked the door to my cabin and didn't go back to the park for many years, and I never forgot the sound of that muddled voice telling me to turn on my headlamp. Livingston's only about an hour from the park, so it's very possible that Bigfoot wanders up here once in a while. But we live right in the middle of town, but we live right in the middle of town, and when I'm on that train engine, don't worry about anything. But I can tell you this, even though I did it first, I now never feel any desire to go back down in Yellowstone National Park. And when summer comes and the town is filled with tourists, I look at them and think, you guys have no idea what's down there, or you just stay here and have a beer or two. On to the next one. A frightening incident involving a Bigfoot-type monster and a four-wheeler occurred in 1998 in the Daniel Boone National Forest near the Menifee-Morgan County line. According to the witness, he and a girlfriend were out riding after dark one evening in October. He was well familiar with the horse trail they were on and had parked near a small pond when a tremendous roar came from the tree line about 40 yards behind them. I was instantly terrified, he said, as this was a sound I have never heard before. It was loud and near. His girlfriend screamed in fear, and he immediately started up the ATV and headed back down the trail toward a privately owned dirt logging road. Having reached the logging road with no sign of pursuit by whatever it was that had made the noise, he only sped up a little until he noticed a dark figure running through the trees alongside the road to his left. This thing was running on two legs. It looked like a very tall and large human form. I looked directly at it for a few seconds, turned back to look at the road, then turned and looked in its direction once more to discover it was still there, keeping pace with us. He looked down at a speedometer. It read 22 miles per hour. As he approached a slight curve, and had to slow down a bit, he looked again, but the creature had disappeared. One second it was there, and the next, no trace of it anywhere. The two were unnerved by the encounter, to say the least. On to the next one. Smallfoot, the mysterious creature of Summershade. Summershade is a small Kentucky town nestled amid the hills and hollows of what lowlanders would call hill country. It is located in Metcalf County, and the scenery there is strikingly beautiful and much different from the marshy lowlands of western Kentucky. Valleys and stone bottom creeks dominate the landscape that is covered with seemingly endless expanses of thick virgin forest. Within these forests, and scattered upon the sides of the stony mountains and creek banks there can be found entrances to countless darkened caves which open into murky caverns containing passages which lead deep underground, connected to the largest known cave system in the world, nearby Mammoth Cave. Who can say where all these tunnels lead and what might be found within them? Perhaps even an unknown species or two might live in such immense subterranean networks as these and utilize them as convenient and highly effective escape routes when needed. In 1995, my brother Robert moved to Summer Shade. His property consisted of roughly 75 acres on two parallel ridges covered with thick growth of pine and fir. A small rocky stream ran near the house, separating it from the barn and completing the picturesque scene. All was well for a few months. Then he noticed that some of his chickens were starting to disappear. He could find no trace of them, nor any spore left behind by any nocturnal visitors to his hen house, it seemed. They were just gone. He thought little of it. Chickens were, after all, usually the primary target of any and all roaming predators, being easy prey items, especially when cooped. Aside from the chickens, None of the larger livestock seemed bothered, and nothing else on the property was disturbed. Nonetheless, 
As the week went by, the chickens continued to vanish, and he remained bewildered as to why. It was not until after two family friends, Tim and Chris, had come for a lengthy visit that the unidentified chicken thieves were finally described. When they announced that they were intending to stay for several weeks, Robert graciously offered them the use of a good-sized camper to sleep in. They took the camper about a hundred yards from the house and parked it beside the heavily wooded area so as to not disturb anyone or to be more bothersome than was necessary. When they were tired of an evening, they would drive to a dirt access road and walk a few steps to the camper. Later, the bedraggled pair told my brother that several times as they returned to the camper, their headlights had illuminated what appeared to be little hairy creatures. These things were only two to three feet tall, they claimed, and were covered from head to toe with dark brown hair. They shied away when the light hit them and ran swiftly out of view, alternating between bipedal and quadrupedal locomotion. Moreover, each time they were witnessed, they appeared to travel in groups from two to four individuals. One night, as the two were readying for sleep, they heard a strange noise, a chattering sound coming from a darkness outside. They looked out very quietly and were alarmed to see a considerable group of these creatures in the woods just outside the door. Worse yet, they seemed to be stealthily approaching the camper, darting from tree to tree. Despite this, every so often, one or two of them would let out another monkey-like grunt. Chris immediately grabbed the handgun Robert had given them for protection. He would have started shooting, Chris said, if Tim hadn't stopped him. He feared that such an act might anger the others, maybe even enough to make them swarm the camper all at once. Then what? They certainly couldn't shoot them all. They noted that the diminutive creatures were covered in dirt and dried mud as if they were freshly returned from a digging endeavor on one of the many nearby creek banks. They were relieved when they finally decided to step outside with their flashlights and again the creatures made a swift retreat from the light. But, even so, neither could sleep a wink after the episode. They hadn't wanted to say anything about it at first, but now things were getting serious. The adults of the household could tell that both of the boys were telling the truth and did not disbelieve their story. They had absolutely no reason to make up such a tale. Besides, Robert himself had seen a somewhat similar creature up close and in broad daylight. Surely, if this was indeed what they were dealing with now, the three-foot variety couldn't be all that scary, especially not with such an array of firearms available. Nearly the entire family were avid hunters. How much trouble could they be? He completely failed to take into account the overwhelming advantages that even smaller animals may afford themselves by traveling in groups. But he would become rudely awakened to this fact one evening not long after. As it happened, one night Robert and the two boys, now accompanied by Chris's father James, found themselves outside after dark trying to locate one of the horses that had escaped the fence. All four were armed with handguns of varying calibers. It was best not to take any unwarranted chances, especially in Carth County. No telling what could be hiding in the cave the two adults carried powerful flashlights in addition to their weapons. As they searched a forested area near where the camper had sat, the group became aware that they were not alone in the woods. They could see small, dark figures moving swiftly and noiselessly through the trees around them. The two boys pointed wildly at the things in silent vindication. The men shined their light to and fro and drew their weapons. The boys followed suit. Whenever one of the light beams hit one of the beings, it would immediately shrink back into the night and out of sight, running at first on its hind legs before dropping down to all fours, then rising once again. They exhibited no eye shine, they noted, and these two appear to be covered in mud. Ro Robert also related how when standing, the creature's front legs looked somewhat longer than the back ones. The worst of it, he later told me, apart from seeing the weird little boogers in the first place, was that they were intent on advancing toward the group of witnesses. 
maneuvering their way on all sides in an apparent attempt to surround them. Only this time, the creatures were operating in complete silence. What these things had in mind as an end result, fortunately, was never discovered, for when one of these things became bold enough to approach within a few inches of James, the alarmed quartet opted for a hasty departure from the area. James later told me that one of the creatures had rushed in from behind him and ran straight up up into a tree without slowing down at all. The force of the movement was such that he could feel the wind on his neck. They all considered themselves lucky that they had somehow managed to make it back to the safety of the house without firing a single shot. I subsequently interviewed each of the witnesses and they all agreed on every detail and each strongly attested to the fact that they weren't particularly interested in going outside after sundown because of it. By the time I was able to make it to the site, things had quieted down, it seemed. In the ensuing months, Robert informed me that every single chicken that he owned, not surprisingly, had disappeared. Business and personal reasons kept me from returning to that part of the state for many months. Then in May, another sighting took place. This one by Robert's son DJ and one of his friends, a neighbor from down the road apiece. My mother had recently returned from Yuma, Arizona and decided to move a trailer onto the property next to Robert's house. She had immediately purchased three dairy cows to put out to graze with the house with the horses. The two youth were busy entertaining themselves in the backyard on the day in question when they noticed that one of the cows had separated from the other two and was running around in the field. On closer inspection, they saw that it was being chased by one of the strange hairy beasts. This one was slightly larger than the other ones previously seen by his father, around four or five feet tall. It also looked quite dirty, they told me, before describing the same curious ambulatory gait as the other witnesses. The only reason the thing didn't catch the cow, both boys claimed, was because it had accidentally ran into an old barbed wire fence and stumbled to the ground. After this, the creature seemed to give up the chase entirely. Moreover, the two claimed to have witnessed a footprint left behind by the thing before a subsequent thunderstorm obliterated any and all traces of evidence which may or may not have existed at the time. They described it as looking like the print of a man. The fact that one of these unknown creatures was evidently confident enough in its own abilities to single-handedly attempt to bring down a full-grown heifer says much about the animal's apparent aggressive nature. Not mentioned, of course, is the fact that a pack of them had already tried to surround the four armed men. The pattern here seems to suggest a mostly nocturnal animal. That they were all covered in dirt or mud in every sighting appears to give credence to the supposition that they must utilize on a regular basis the intricate and extensive cave systems that exist in the area. They would almost certainly be omnivores, taking full advantage of every available food source. Could these mysterious creatures actually live in the area, as described, yet still remains unknown to modern science? The answer is yes. The region seems to be a favored haunt of these mysterious monkeys, bordered on three sides by the state's largest lakes, Barren River Lake, Dale Hollow, and Lake Cumberland. The land between and around these bodies of water remains largely virgin and unspoiled. On to the next one. I met Joseph in Durango, Colorado, about 20 years ago. I was in my usual spot in the diner just off East 8th when the sky comes in and sits down at the counter next to me. He was dressed like a farmer, all dusty and sweaty, but his eyes were different. They had a haunted look, the thousand-yard stare. I used to see the guys coming back from the jungle over there. The waitress, Ruby, came over, and the guy stammered that he wants a coffee, strong and black. Nothing unusual in that, but the way his hands move, flitting around like a couple of nervous birds, the way his eyes tried to be everywhere at once, that got my attention. 
the guy was young, maybe early 20s. Didn't look like a vet, but he was acting like he just escaped from the worst firefight in history. I couldn't help myself. I hate to see people suffer. And I swung around to face him. You okay, son? You're looking pretty strung out. He spun on his stool and looked at me. I swear, it took him a good five seconds to actually focus on my face and really see me. His eyes kept drifting. I'm good, tired, just tired, he said. I smiled, my best emphatic smile. Son, I see a lot of folks come through here, a lot of them tired. You're well beyond tired. What happened? He finally looked me in the eyes. You wouldn't believe me. I widened my smile slightly and waved Ruby over for more coffee. Try me. He looked around him like someone was going to jump him. Then he looked back at me. Hell, I gotta tell someone, but I promise you are not going to believe me. This is the story Joseph told me, minus the pauses, the prompting, and most of his more colorful language. So, I work, or I guess I worked on a farm down in New Mexico. I'm not telling you exactly where, but in McKinley County. I had a little house on the edge of the property. I did my work, got paid, then didn't see many other people on most days. It was a good life, comfortable and with an income that was pretty decent for the area. Most days, after I'd done everything that needed doing, I'd go for a walk in the evening. Out there, on a good night, it's beautiful. You couldn't count all the stars in the sky. The ridge, silhouetted against the starry sky, was beautiful. I loved my evening walk. Just me and the stars. You feel like you're the only person in the world, and it's all yours. One evening, a couple of nights back, I stepped out for a walk. It was still cool, even though it's June, probably in the mid-40s, but that never worried me. The cool air makes you feel alive. It was still light, and I hadn't gone far, up toward the ridge, when I spotted a blood trail on the ground. Not much, just a drop here and there. Still, you learn to spot things like that when you live out there. I figured it was a deer, injured by a coyote or something, and followed it. When I lost the light, I lost the trail. There are lots of stars in the sky up there, but following a blood trail at night, even with starlight, is beyond me. I come a fair way from the house and started thinking I should probably head back. But I felt restless, like I had to go somewhere, do something. Nothing I could put my finger on, but just a feeling that now was not the time to head back. I didn't have much to do the next day, so I just let the feeling guide me. I kept walking, assuming that at some point I'd get tired. The restless feeling would run out, and then I could head home. It must have been around midnight when I hit the road. Now, calling it a road is a bit generous. It's a dirt service road, but it's the best we've got for 30 or 40 miles, so it's the road. I stood there for a minute, idly kicking the stones up the road and staring at the sky. Then I got the creep. You know that feeling like you know someone's watching you? I felt like there were a pair of eyes burning into my back. You live alone in an area that got wild animals in it. You learn to trust feelings like that. I turned slowly to look along the road. No wolf or mountain lion was standing there. Just a man. Not many people will be walking around out there at midnight and I recognized this one straight off. The heavy sheepskin vest and the wide-brimmed hat all meant it could only be George Sullivan. 
he worked on the next farm over. It might be a few miles between us, but it was about as close to neighbors as you get in that sort of place. Seeing me looking in his direction, George waved and came over. This was a bit strange. George and I were nodding acquaintances, not really friends. Nothing wrong with George. He liked his own company. Hi, Joe, he said when he got close. You're out late tonight. Yeah, I responded. Felt a bit restless. Needed to stretch my legs, I guess. Me too. It sounded like he was smiling, but it being night and him wearing the wide-brimmed hat, I couldn't tell. Felt like I might head up to the ridge. Want to come along? Now, that was just weird. George never usually thought out company like that. It was the middle of the night, and I started to feel that something here just wasn't adding up. I didn't feel restless anymore. I just wanted to get back home. Now, I said, I think I'll head back. Fair enough. I might as well keep you company to the fence line. That made sense. The fence line would give him a straight turn up to the ridge, but it didn't sound like George's usual behavior. There was a little voice somewhere in the back of my head whispering that something was off. I couldn't exactly tell him not to come with me, though, so I turned and headed back. George fell in step beside me, and we started back toward my place. That when I gagged. Something somewhere stunk. It was a sweetly putrid smell, the worst thing I've ever smelled in my life. Somehow, it seemed to combine rotting meat, fruit, and rotten eggs, all rolled into one. It brought a tear to my eyes. I turned to George. God, what's that awful smell? He paused and seemed to sniff the air for a second. I guess something died out there. He turned his head to me. Happens now and again. I was going to say more, but something stopped me. Instead, I walked back toward my house with George at my side. I know we talked on the way back, but I can't for the life of me remember what we talked about. It's like I was on autopilot, responded without thinking till we got to the fence line. There, George wished me a good night and headed up for the ridge. I went straight back to my house. Thankfully, Somewhere around the fence line, the smell seemed to disappear. I'd had enough that night. I kicked off my boots and crashed on top of my bed. That night, I had an odd dream. I was talking to Mike Hannett, another one of my neighbors. Behind him was a churchyard, the one at St. Patrick in Vanderwagen. There was a funeral going on. Mike kept trying to explain something to me but I could never make out what he was talking about. He was very excited and acting as if he needed me to understand something, but I just couldn't make it out. I awoke, thinking there was something there I needed to grasp. Whatever he was talking about was important, but the feeling faded as I started on my day's job. I had some shopping to do in Gallup that day. By the time I got back, it was mid-afternoon. I flicked on the TV as I came in. It provided background noise while I put stuff away in the kitchen. Just as I came back out into the living room, something was on about a missing man being found dead. The reporter said something was odd about the case, and I turned to pay a bit more attention. Just then, the TV seemed to lose the signal. The screen dissolved into static. Well, it probably wasn't important anyway. I had an early dinner that night. Then the restless feeling came over me again. I hadn't planned to go out for a walk that night. George had spooked me the night before, but somehow I couldn't stop myself. Anything I tried to do in the house just seemed like a waste of time. The magazine I'd been reading was meaningless, and the housework I'd planned on seemed like a waste of time. Realizing I couldn't fight it, I pulled on a jacket and headed out. This time, though, and unlike my usual practice, I took along a large flashlight. There's nothing like a good walk to clear your head. As I made my way without thinking toward the dirt road that runs along the base of the ridge, 
My subconscious was putting the puzzle together. The dream, Mike, the funeral, the blood trail, the missing man, George. George, I'd reached the road without really noticing. There was George, standing there, almost as if waiting for me. Out late again, Joe? This time, I could really hear the smile. How about taking that walk tonight? He stepped toward me, and again, I smelled that awful odor of decay. I took a step back, gagging. I'd been expecting the smell, but it was still overpowering. I'd worked it out. This was not George. Three days ago, Mike had told me about the funeral he'd gone to. George's funeral. I backpedaled a little more down the road. George, or whatever that was, followed. Where are you going, Joe? I brought the flashlight up and switched it on, shining it into the thing's face. It was George's face, in a way. The cheeks and the tip of the nose had already started to decay. The eye sockets were empty, but there was a red glow behind them. The lips, cracked and weeping, were twisted up into a smile. It was not a friendly smile. It was the smile of something who had just seen its next victim. The slightly ironic grin that suggests it was enjoying itself at my expense. I was stunned, frozen in place. I felt like a rabbit in a car's headlight. As I stood there, transfixed, the smile broadened, the grin stretched, and finally ripped the face off of my old neighbor. The lower half of the face fell away, and I could see a mouth filled with far too many teeth that now stretched in a grin from ear to ear. I felt myself getting smaller. No, that wasn't right. It was getting taller. It seemed to slough off the human skin like a snake shedding. As the covering fell away, I saw its legs, gray, spindly, and lengthening. Now, it stood a good foot taller than me. Something dragged my screaming mind back to reality. Something clicked in my brain. I turned and ran. I leapt from the road, up onto a path into the woods at the base of the ridge. The sanest part of me hoped to lose whatever it was among the trees. My flashlight was dying. I switched it off and shoved it into my jacket pocket. The action distracted me, and I stumbled over a root. Barely recovering my footing, I glanced back over my shoulder. I hadn't lost it. It was stalking along behind me. It no longer made any attempt to look human. In the dim starlight, I made out a tall gray body. It must have been eight feet tall, but spindly and thin. It was almost a giant walking skeleton, covered in gray skin. It was all out of proportion, though. Its legs were ridiculously long. Its arms ended in curved talons somewhere near its knees. I didn't stare long enough to make out the face, but I saw two glowing red spots where the eyes should be, and a black maw for a mouth. I'd seen enough. I put on another burst of speed, adrenaline giving my legs strength I didn't know they had. I risked a quick glance back and noticed the thing was barely jogging. It was toying with me. It could catch me any time it wanted to. There was no chance I could outrun this thing. I had no hope. I reached an especially dense part of the woods. I was out of the thing's sight for a few seconds. There was a slight chance if I could move quickly, I grabbed a branch and hauled myself up into a tree, climbing as quickly as I could until I would be above its eye level. I had barely stopped climbing when it came around the trees below me. I kept my hand over my mouth, trying to calm my panting, desperate to make no noise. It halted. Its head swung around on its spindly neck as it checked out the area. It seemed confused to have lost me. Then it wailed. I've never heard any sound like that before. Its scream sounded like a crying baby who've been badly hurt. But mixed into that 
was a more profound, angrier noise. I can't describe it any better than that. I also can't explain how it was able to make that scream for what seemed like a minute without taking a breath. The noise was enough to cover any I might make, though. While it screamed below me, I unscrewed the flashlight as quietly as I was able and slid a battery out. When it stopped screaming, I hurled the battery as far as I could into the wood. The battery stuck a tree. The thing's head snapped to that direction, and then it was off, racing through the woods faster than I thought possible. As soon as it left, I climbed down the tree as quickly as I could and started running down the trail back to the road. I reached the road and stood for a second, panting. Then the sound reached my ears. It was a sound I'd heard before. There are deer up in the forest along the ridge. Now they were coming my way. I tried to get out of the way and just managed as they broke from the wood cover. It looked like the whole herd rushing out of the trees and along the road. They ignored me, their eyes rolling with fear. Too late, I realized what they were running from. The gray figure bounded out of the woods, standing there not five feet from me. This was it then. One of its taloned arms flashed down. It smacked into one of the deer, sending it sprawling. Before the deer could right itself, the gray creature twisted its body, its mouth gripping the deer's neck. There was a crunch of bone, a splash of blood, and the deer stopped moving. I backed slowly off the road. I didn't know if it was the dust the deer raised, the distraction of the deer themselves, or the fact it was already eating. Whatever the reason, I was able to slip away. I crept back into the field, and when I felt safe enough, I ran. I got back to my house and piled everything I could into my truck. Then I left. I'd been driving ever since. This is the first time I've stopped. I'm going to have coffee, some food, then I'm leaving. I'm going north, as far as I can. There is no way I'm staying anywhere near here. That was Joseph's story. Despite what he said, I believed him. I'd heard enough of skinwalkers before. He was a fortunate young man to have escaped this one. I gave him some advice including the address of a Navajo friend he might like to talk to before he left town. I doubted he would, though. He seemed determined not to stop south of the Canadian border. Once I finished my coffee, I left the diner and started driving south. He may not have told me exactly where all this happened, but he'd given me enough clues. In the middle of the afternoon... I turned up a country service road that ran along the base of a wooded ridge. As I came around a corner, I startled a small herd of deer. They scattered, diving for the trees, all except one. It stood there, watching me drive past. I swear it smiled. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!